Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you, as always, to everyone who's tuning in. Um, it's Monday. Monday interviews are a thing I'm trying to do here on this old stream. So, uh, today, I, I, we'll just fucking get started. Today we got Brandon Sheffield, um, very good hey. friend of mine. Uh, go ahead and say hi to the stream, Brandon. Hi, it's me. I'm here. So, I will. I, I feel like I want to let you introduce yourself, but first I will introduce the introduction, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> It was it was especially important to me that I get you on this thing pretty early because uh, you were super important and helpful kind of in helping me p plug into games um, from like a really early age, actually, just because you're work with Insert Credit. And for people who don't know, Brandon Sheffield, I think, first left his mark in games um, editing and writing for a site called Insert Credit, which was super awesome, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it. Um, but that was super formative to me. I had been writing, uh, like, just kind of, like, writing shitty freelance reviews about Mac games for about three or four years as, like, a high schooler back then. And uh, I didn't really, like, I, I was kind of, like, losing my interest. I, I, you know, I was like, eh, I was tired of the, like, you know, the, the, the big bold headers and, like, graphics, gameplay, sound, all that stuff. Like, I was super bored. Um, and come to think of it, there might be, people, pe might be people in chat who don't even remember that era of games, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah. Or games writing, rather. But I found Insert Credit, I think it was probably through a link somewhere to one of Tim's pieces, and it was just this this completely different way of talking and thinking about fighting game, or video games, um, about all kinds of video games and all kinds of other stuff. And to me, at least, it was super important in kind of keeping me interested and, and like, I think pushing me to, like, get to explore more that, uh, that you can do about writing in games. And obviously, uh, a whole lot has happened since then. Um, you were, like, you, you brought me on to edit Game Developer Magazine after you pieced out and, like, a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, I just, like... To me, the, the, this interview is actually, to me, it's kind of a chance to, like, kind of unpack uh, the work that went into you being you and kind, of, <laughs> and kind of tease out, like, all the different shit that you do and how you got involved. Because, like, and this is kind of, like, a bigger thing, I guess, but um, something that I, I like to talk a lot about the process of uh, about skill development and part of that, like, once, once you start talking about getting good at things, then you also start talking about, like, what opportunities does that unlock, right? Like, what can you do now that you couldn't before? And there was, like, there, if I think about, like, career stuff, if I think about breaking into the game dev industry and that kind of stuff, um, there's, a, there's, like, a lot that I learned from you that's, that, like, I don't think you get in, you don't, you, you probably wouldn't get in a game dev education, right, like a formal education, um, or it's not immediately obvious that, like, there's more to being a game developer than just learning how to program or learning how to write or whatever. And so, like, the more I kind of followed your work and the more that I saw, you, like, you kind of level up as a developer um, and just continue to navigate the industry, the more, the more I thought, like, there's a lot that I, can, that I can continue to be learning from you. And, that, and so, like, it's been super inspirational and super helpful to just to know you and have you in my life. So I wanted to use this interview as a chance to kind of give you those props and then to, to figure out, like, how the hell you ended up being you. Because you're, pre you're a pretty weird dude, man. <laughs> um, well, that's all very nice of you to say. So with that, I'd say, like... Tell the stream a little bit about yourself. Who the hell are you? Uh, I'm a guy who liked video games maybe a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so started that insert credit website, which we turned into... It started off as a reason to just go to E3 for free. Yeah. Um, back, when, yeah. back when that was... Is that, is that still easy to do? Can, or is, did they crack down on that? I think they cracked down on that, but nowadays you can be like, "Yeah, I'm a streamer." And right. I'm, like, a, I'm a YouTuber. Here's my channel. Yeah, Let there's there's still ways to scam. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, then we very quickly realized that we wanted to do something a little different and talk about games in a different way, and so we kind of did that uh, for a while. It was fun, and uh, it's it's weird because. That website is the best thing probably that I have ever made in my life <laughs> <laughs> because it got it got me a job, it got friends jobs, it got people on the forums jobs. Like that website was a this weird hub from which a whole bunch of game culture 
uh, spraying. Later. Yeah, there's it's 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 like it's I think of it now, and it's almost like insert credit our alumni are like a secret society, right? Like yep. we could all get tattoos, and I feel like there's a bunch of us out there in, that that are like doing like like oh man, you never guess that this person so and so who's doing this thing used to read the forums a lot or whatever, right? Or like right. wrote some shitty thing about this thing when they were seventeen and posted it on the insert credit, whatever. Um, and then the other half is just like uh, super kind of like i don't i i don't know just i i'd say like random people right and and you know like people who never who didn't go on to like work in the industry people who went on to do other shit or maybe just lived like kind of a normal life right but they still had these interesting perspectives on video games right and that was that was kind yeah. of eye opening to me to think like you don't like people engage and embed in this in this medium in super different ways and like it could be like this dude who's a checkout you know cashier or whatever at target who also just happens to have like really strong thoughts about and, and like well informed thoughts about like you know Genesis RPGs or some shit. You know? Yeah, yeah, you find a lot of that nowadays. Uh, well, I find a lot of that nowadays. Basically, um, it used to, I used to have this kind of love hate relationship with insert credit and the people on the forums and feeling like there were too many memes and weird things coming from it which frankly should have been f flattering but really annoyed me at the time uh it was it was against what i wanted to do i felt but nowadays it's like if i if i meet someone who's who says they read insert credit in 2003 then i'm like all right well we've we've got plenty to talk about we right. can be friends <laughs> <laughs> And and so uh, and so insert credit like the the kind of the first incarnation had phased out by like the kind of the what like two thousand what five or something yeah two thousand five or six yeah. and then um, so you were we, at you were at Game Developer Magazine for a while let's I want I, I want to finish the the Brandon introduction oh, first yeah. right so yeah so I went to Game Developer Magazine and Gama Sutra um, Game Developer in interestingly. I, you know, when I graduated from college, I needed to get a job, and so I was like, well, I'm already writing about video games, I guess this is what I should do. I applied to a bunch of places, and they all rejected me, because they had all read my work before, and, <laughs> and they were worried that I was going to try to make them do something other than box quotes and uh, follow a rev review format and, and whatnot. Um, so none of those people hired me, even though they were all very interested. And then I wound up getting the job with Game Developer Magazine because they had never heard of me before, and uh, <laughs> and so they, they they read the stuff that the you know the reports I had written on GDC mm -hmm. um, without knowing me, and they were like, "All right, that's cool." <laughs> nice. Uh, so that, that was amusing. I could only get hired by people that hadn't heard of me before. Um, and then Gama Sutra as well. I was doing that simultaneously, uh, and then I got kind of bored uh, because I felt that having done sort of some form of game journalism-y thing for a bunch of years, I was uh, stagnating and not doing anything really new or challenging myself, so I decided I wanted to write stuff in games, and the first real thing I got there was when I... I I met these guys at Game Connection, and I really liked their poster art. And it turned out they were from Thailand. And I was like, hey guys, I have a film degree. You should let me write your games. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then they, they, they said okay, uh, pretty much. Um, not exactly like that, but I, I wound up rewriting this this one game, the first game that has a lot of my writing in it, is called Barnyard Blast, Swine of the Night. Damn. Which is, yeah, it's a, it's pretty embarrassing to go back at it now, back and look at it now because speaking of memes, that's pretty much what they wanted was mm. a bunch of, you know, winner is you style jokes. Gotcha. Uh, which I what, did make. I did made it, some other good ones. What did it end up coming out for on? DS. Okay. Wow. So I can yeah. go pick up a copy of Barnyard Blast somewhere. Absolutely, you can. Uh, I might do and, this. And go for it. Um, it's not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a very good game. No. But it is kind of interesting a little bit, sort of. The The best thing for me was just a few months ago, I was at the flea market here in Oakland, and I saw one of those, you know, 150 in one 
DS pirate yeah. cart packages. And and there were two main games featured on the front. It had tons of games all around this this you know this box. But there were two main games right on the front, and one of them was Barnyard Blast. Yes. Was like, <laughs> all right, I made it finally. It's the you know. <laughs> Uh, I made it to piracy. I, I don't think NPD group numbers ever appropriately accounted for like the long tail flea market effect, but that's definitely something that should go into yeah <laughs> in, into your 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 yearly right. It's uh, it's interesting to 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 think about that one because it they got a good deal with a distributor, so a whole bunch were printed. And mm-hmm. so they wound up being really cheap in a bunch of targets and stuff. Huh. And so a surprising number of people have played it, and there are like a few YouTube videos about it, which is a real, <laughs> real surprise to me. Uh, you know, video. there's a video with like 10,000 views of someone playing through uh, Barnyard Blast. I'm like, what the heck? Um, so then <clears throat> after that, I started ri- doing more writing in games for other for other games. Um, I wound up doing, you know, a lot of the the terminal text in the DS game Moon, which was the sequel to Dementium, not the sequel, the uh, spiritual successor to Dementium. Dementium. Uh, which was, yeah, DS horror game. Ah. I had one line in Dementium too. Nice. <laughs> there. Um, there are... It seems like there's. A, I remember like the kind of early DS era where, where there's still a lot of neat, like weird stuff coming. I guess there's still weird stuff coming out for it, but I mean like like Lost in Blue and a lot of the stuff around then that seems super narrative focused in the beginning, or at least yeah. that there's a recept- receptivity to like v- the more visually novelty stuff. Yeah, there was a lot more weird stuff back then, but there's there's some visual novelty stuff on the Vita now. It's just all about touching twelve year olds. Uh, okay. So. It doesn't really it doesn't really <laughs> s- scratch that same itch that you might be hoping for <laughs> with expanding your mind. Um, <clears throat> then I got a job with a writing, being narrative director for a large company, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. Um, but right. that didn't work out, not because of me or because of the team or because of the game, but because of money, and that's too bad. Um, so then I got depressed about that and decided it was time to quit and start my own little video game company, and that's what has happened. Now I have Necrosoft Games, and we make some tiny little video games that some people like a lot, and most people haven't seen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which which I feel like is actually... Uh, that's that's kind of Hallmark Brandon Sheffield, right? Yeah, v- I guess Very so. specific days for very, for very uh, specific people... But invariably, and it's you know you mentioned this with the insert credit as well. Like, uh, if if people like the same things, not even the same things. I think it's if people have a similar, uh, similarly narrow taste to yours, then you get along with them. Yeah. <laughs> like they could be, they could index super hard on something that you don't like, but at the very least, that would catch your interest. And that was yeah, kind definitely. of what I felt like uh, like when I when when uh, I met you. I think. If I remember correctly, what happened was so I met Tim Rogers in Japan and hung out with him a few times. And then we, when he came back to Oakland, he did one of those things where he like holds court at a restaurant and has a bunch of people who don't know each other uh, talk, like wait their turn to talk to him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which is something that I didn't realize was like a regular thing that he did until I went to a few of those. But yeah. Shortly thereafter, I think you were interested in inserting in, in uh, reviving insert credit, and I was interested in egging you on. Um, and so mm-hmm. uh, I kind of like pushed myself into there, but it was it was like my initial connection with you was on fighting games, and at at the time I didn't think anything of it, right? Because pretty much most of the people who I knew in video games, since I wasn't like professionally really uh, working in that space at that time, if I knew anyone in video games, it was through fighting games, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't think it, it was is that strange until I realized like, oh, you're actually kind of embedded in the industry proper, right? Like GD Mag was kind of, was the major publication for the industry. Um, you know, Gama Sutra is still similar. GDC, you know, like kind of the, this, the core event that the industry rotates ar- around, right? So you're like a regular games dude 
in, who is yeah. who is also into fighting games. And then the more I got to know you, the more I realized that your interest in fighting games is different, right? Like you, yeah. you didn't engage quite the same pattern that compared to like the people who who you see show up on streams, you know, who who go to the, the tournaments, who go to events, who go to Evo, that kind of stuff, right? So mm -hmm. given that 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 most of the people I know who are watching this stream want to talk fighting games, like let's do that first, right? Uh, yeah. Let, let's. Yeah. Uh, I I wanted to say one one weird thing yeah. about that one weird trick, man. Um, <laughs> just, uh, I, w I went back and read reread my reviews of like m I mostly reviewed KOF on mm -hmm. Insert Credit. Um, I wrote I wrote about fighting games sometimes, and it's very evident to me. You know, I don't play. I'm not a technical person really when mm -hmm. it comes to fighting games I, I, but I like how they feel or how they move or how they flow and stuff like that and uh, and it's so obvious that I was thinking about them all that way I mean all, all the time when mm -hmm. I was when I was writing about these things like let's see what what, what did I have here um, yeah talking about 2001 and how much I liked it um, oh yeah there there was KOF EX2 mm-hmm and I and I was writing here, but all the while I wanted it to be a console game. I wanted to be playing it on, say, a Dreamcast. Aww. And and that's it's like a, you know, who cares what platform it's on? Right. Except if a Dreamcast game has a certain kind of aesthetic to you and a certain kind of feeling to you, and you want it to be more in that direction. And I feel like that was the way that I sort of interacted with these things. Um, like I cared, I cared so much about 2001 for some reason because I really liked the art KOF 2001, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I was writing about characters and stuff. And I say, so in 2002, KOF 2002, we have a melee in stagnation. She's no longer the d dynamic new face. She's huddled in with the girls in the women's team. She's <laughs> not as present as she once was, and certainly not as central to the universe. So like, what? That that wasn't. Like, who cares yeah. about that? I it's, do, it's, but <laughs> why? That, that's interesting to me, though, because, like, if there's if there's one thing that, that like, if I had to d define, uh, if I had to, to come up with, like, a very finite description of you, I think sensitive would be an adjective that would come to mind almost immediately, <laughs> right? But, it, but like, it's, it's super powerful in video games because, like, this is all stuff that matters, right? And especially when you're talking about game feel, right? Like... Uh, that's something which I feel like fighting game, like people who play fighting games get super connected to games and, and they're so like, we interact with everything about a character at such a visceral level, right? And the game at such a visceral level that there, that feel is actually, is, is a huge part of it, but it's something that people didn't know how to talk about or describe for a long time. Right. And when I think about a lot of the stuff that uh, that insert credit was, was doing early on is like kind of using a more I experiential and emotional uh, outlook on a game to talk about why it's good and why it's not good. Right. And like you see, I saw a lot of that later in a lot of Tim's work where he would go super in deep as to like why this jump is better than this other jump or whatever. Right. Um, the sticky friction essay for, for Kotaku and a million other things. But like it, to me, it all comes back to that, that, that kind of that core sensitivity. Right. Is that like you're super you're super affected by a game that you that that you really like. And you're so particular that I feel like you end up with a pretty good vocabulary for describing what you like and don't like. Mm. Just so you can explain to someone like, no, this is this thing that you're doing here is wrong. And I know you don't care about it, but you should because it matters for these reasons. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that that to me is fascinating. Like how you've you've always kind of been like an SNK or a KOF guy, from what I recall. Um, I mean, you've always mm -hmm. kind of been on like the <laughs> the 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 like the obscure side for for video games in general, right? Like you didn't have a Super Nintendo growing up. Yeah, it was it was TG sixteen and, and a Genesis. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I had the so I had the the Turbo Graphics. And the and the duo before I even got a Genesis, um, but I played Genesis a bit more than the other stuff because my stepbrother had a Genesis, and mm -hmm. so I was able to play that a bit earlier. I I bought a Genesis in high school, but which I was let's see Ge when I was in high school, Genesis had been out. I don't know. I it was I think when I started getting into Genesis, the Genesis three had just come out, which was like. Majesco's last ditch cash grab. Um, huh. Maybe some people still want to play this. That was in 
I don't know, 96 or 97. So I was, That's I super was pretty, late. Yeah, it was pretty late to a lot of, um, a lot of that stuff. It was mostly just Turbo Graphics. I think I, it's, I think I got like Genesis, then Super Nintendo, then um, Saturn, then PlayStation, all around, you know, the the late mid to to much later 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't even have a Super Nintendo until college. I mean, a, a regular NES. Gotcha. Until college. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I followed a, a slightly different path, which I'm grateful for, because it definitely informed the way that I played and cared about video games, because I, you know, I could only afford, I could only afford what I could afford. Right. And I jumped straight, pretty much straight into the CD sound era. Okay. Um, with the piece, the, the Turbo Duo, and it's awesome music, and, but I, d- I mean, I, I did, as I said, play um, Genesis stuff with my stepbrother, Gunstar Heroes, Sonic 2, so I had those starting in my, like, age 12, 13, 14, so that, that, it w- that was still formative. So how'd you get pulled into fighting games? Um, the first time I played a fighting game was Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo at a friend's house. Okay. He he had everything, I guess, uh, that I could conceive of at the time. Um, and I remember, first of all, being confused by how many buttons there were on the Super Nintendo controller. Uh, and then, you know, he would try sort of to describe to me how I was supposed to do these moves and stuff and I couldn't figure it out um, and I couldn't figure out why people liked something like this so much because it was so complicated and difficult to pull off mm-hmm. um, but eventually I don't know I played it a couple times at his house and then I saw a Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition I didn't know that's what it was it just said Street Fighter 2 yeah. but I saw a Rain- Rainbow Edition at its 7-Eleven and I was like oh man this one's super weird. I like this because, uh, you know, um, Blanca's turning into Bison as he. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird. This is a weird game. I kind of like what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> but I think, you know, I got more and more into it as as I bought a Neo Geo CD mm-hmm. uh, and got all these King of Fighters games. And started really playing those. <clears throat> and I think what got me to, to really stick with it was partially the load times. Like, you had to commit yourself so much to, <laughs> to really playing this game. Because it, you a stage would load for three minutes. Oh, my God. CD. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Uh, there was this little juggling monkey that would be the loading screen for you. And I, I, I came to hate that monkey. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the monkey was a freaking jerk. He's getting in the way of me and my fun. But um, so I got into KOF. I really liked the the big sound in KOF. You know, the the all the sound effects are overblown. They mm-hmm. sound like they're they're all peaking. They were recorded poorly and are just blown out. Um, and I loved that. It made the game feel large and and cool. The first time I ever saw a Neo Geo game was at this this store called uh, Beeman Company in Fremont, California, where they had just a bunch of cool nerd things, um, which I just thought were cool things. I didn't know about the nerd part uh, yet. <laughs> but they had, you know, Sailor Moon wall scrolls and uh, Son Mei bootleg anime CDs sure. uh, soundtracks. And, and then one day I walked in there and there was this giant hunking console with uh with giant cartridge in it and i'm like what the hell is that and they were playing samurai showdown and and they're like it's neo geo duh <laughs> i mean and, uh, I, I i remember like I, I read like a game pro i subscribed for several years i remember the ads for the neo geo console where there's like a like a lame like plain hot dog and then there was one with like mustard and ketchup and relish and there and i forget it, it, i think it was like some stupid joke about how they're how about how their competition are weenies um, yeah but like for me the, the neo geo was always like oh man maybe if i ran a bake sale out of my my garage every weekend for two months then i can <laughs> buy a neo geo and if i do another month then i can buy a game 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, so for me, I went with the CD because it was cheaper. Nice. Um, and But I didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. I borrowed $300 from the richest friend that I knew. Nice! Which, Wait, how, me, how old were you at this point? I was like 15 or 16. Years old. Oh, I, shit. I can't, I can't believe that I did that because <clears throat> I had no... I didn't know when I was going to be able to pay him back. I just, like, unashamedly was like, hey, can I have $300? <laughs> and, uh, and then I bought a Neo Geo CD with, like, 10 games. I was like, this is such a good deal. I have to do this. I have to. Um, I did pay him back, by the way. Nice. Uh, in, in not too much time. I had a job and all. I just didn't have $300 right then. Um, and, uh, and around the same time, I also got the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Okay. Which... Um, I actually happen to have one sitting right next <laughs> to me. Oh, hi, Neo Geo Pocket Color. Look yeah. at that cutie. Yeah, this is this is the the uh, NNGPC, the new Neo Geo Pocket Color. Oh. It's the, it's the last uh, run hmm. that they made. It's sli- slightly smaller. Um, it's a really cool system. I really like it. But it had tons of fighting games, and there was such a close feeling to the game when you played on on that system because it's got this clicky stick. That's right, that. I do remember that. It's got a clicky stick. It had pre- pre- pressure sensitive buttons, um, <clears throat> and it just it felt really good playing fighting games on this. And suddenly, I felt like you know those moves that I was so confused by and had so much trouble with on the Super Nintendo were so simple and straightforward on the Neo Geo Pocket, and mm-hmm. it wasn't. It wasn't because, like, part of it was because I had played some more things. But a, I think the biggest part was that the control was just better, and it right. fit how my brain wanted to work. And um, <clears throat> and I got the clicky stick controller for the Neo Geo CD, and that made that easier. And then when I eventually moved to the Saturn, I was like, well, this is close enough. Uh, and so Saturn games felt really good, too. And... So I think probably the Neo Geo Pocket Color was my biggest fighting game connection until the Saturn, and then I was le- by then I liked fighting games already, but I mm-hmm. I wasn't very good at them. Yeah. Um, so tell me about that a little bit, right? You've, so far, you've been talking about the time and the and the the, the method that you've been playing fighting games, but. Uh, I mean, certainly I remember playing Street Fighter 2 when it first came out, and, um, and I think I was like five or six at the time, mm-hmm. um, and I couldn't, like, it, it wasn't until the game came out for Super Nintendo years later that I was actually, like, capable, like, my hands were actually capable of doing any of those things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and But I remember at the time, like, everyone was kind of playing them like it was it was just like a, oh the the point at a, at a friend's sleepover or you know a visit to a friend's house or whatever where you bust out the game consoles you're gonna play some street fighter until one person wins too much and then it sucks um, yeah <laughs> was that was that how you were doing it too or were you mostly just like playing at home alone by yourself or like i was mostly playing home alone by myself mm-hmm. um i <clears throat> there was some like the the time I can remember in that early, in those early days for me playing a fighting game with another person uh, was Mortal Kombat 2 on the Game Gear, where a friend and I would switch off playing. Okay, yeah. Um, and so we weren't really playing together, but he would be like, you're not very good at that. Or I would <laughs> be like, you could totally use, don't you know how to do Raiden's fly across the screen thingy? Right. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't really play fighting games with other people until Asuka 120%. Okay. That was the real time when I, like, I, I would play, try to play KOF with some people, but it didn't really, I did, there was absolutely no culture of playing video games in my high school. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just, I just didn't know a whole lot of people who played games and i knew nobody who played fighting games except i guess maybe it's possible that guy whose friend whose house i went over to that had street fighter 2 on super nintendo maybe he played but i wasn't really in touch with him anymore gotcha so So, i uh, I knew i knew oscar was gonna come up eventually um yeah and this is more for the stream's sake but uh a couple times a year i think it's it, it usually boils down to whenever you're in southern california yeah um 
Brandon and some of our other mutual friends host a get together where uh, we play a, 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 a specific set of old games, and it usually ends up being uh, this weird, uh, like, final semi leaked build of Asuka 120% Burning Fest. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Garodin. Yeah, Garodin Fist Break Blow. Break Blow, yep. Fist or Twist. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Uh, I've I have for a long time wanted to introduce Brandon to to like other to to poverty fighting game players because I think that your tastes would overlap significantly. Yeah. Um, but it's a super it's it's a it's a they're they're a bunch of fun and it's even I'd say it's their games that it's, it's even more fun to play with people who don't really know fighting games all that well. But yes. I, I have to know like how the hell you discovered that game of all games and how it stuck with you. Yeah. So I was thinking about that today, and. Asuka came from our friend Vincent Diamante, who was the co-founder of Insert Credit. <clears throat> he was like the other import game dude in my dorm in mm -hmm. college, freshman year. And, you know, he was the other dude with the Dreamcast before they came out in America, so we were trading games. And Vince was always better at fighting games, mm -hmm. or at, at, at any video game than me. Um, and you know, we were playing, we both had our Saturns with us as well, and uh, we were playing some games there. We actually used to play Street Fighter Alpha 3 Dramatic Mode. That was nice. super, super fun <laughs> in Survival. Uh, survival Dramatic Mode is excellent fun. But um, <clears throat> he's like, have you ever played this game, Oscar 120%? And I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, God, okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so he, sh he shows it to me, and uh, he's... Vince, especially at the time, was not one for pulling punches or anything. So he was just destroying me and wiping the floor with me uh, <laughs> while we were playing this game. And I was like, I don't really get it. But he did dis part of the way he described it appealed to me because it seemed like, well, there were only three buttons, really realistically two. The third button is actually A and B together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the con and you know and the D pad and it was. And everything made sense to me. Like, I could kind of envision the whole picture of what the game was. Right. And so I borrowed it from him. And I played it for, like, a week and against the AI, which is my was my usual way of playing fighting games uh, by myself. And <clears throat> and I, I just chose a character that I thought was cool, this character called Ryuko, who's a volleyball player. And I started playing around, and... I was mostly, you know, spamming special moves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I was doing. But through spamming special moves, I wound up accidentally linking some things together. And so then when I went back to Vince, and I was like, hey, let's play again. And I was playing Ryuko, who was, as far as he was concerned, a character that wasn't very good, as far as he was concerned at the time. Right. Because he'd only played it, you know, a few times with his, with his friends in... Um, in Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, and so I was, <clears throat> you know, I was playing with Ryuko, and I I did this thing. I I got him into I I did this grab, and then it slams on him on the ground, and then I did a f forward dash headbutt that hit him back up into the air. I jumped and slammed him down, and then did a dive, and it took thirty percent of his health off. And he was like, "I did not know you could do that." <laughs> <laughs> And so suddenly, um, because of that, he's like, there's there's a lot more to this game, isn't there? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, but I knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. I had figured out how to do that combination. Um, and so because of that, he and I started playing with each other mm -hmm. a lot. And he was better than me pretty consistently until we were pretty much dead even. And... So I think that that game really kind of made me feel like I could play fighting games yeah. as as long as they had a system that, that let me do it without a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I, I'd like to describe Asuka for people that may not be Please. familiar. Um, it's, an, it's an all girls fighting game that is was pretty speedy for the time. It's not fa as fast as something like Melty Blood. Um, or all the all the anime fighters of today, but 
it was it was pretty fast and but the main appeal to me aside from fast because i always liked to play the fast character in in whatever fighting game um the main appeal was the consistency and simplicity of inputs so uh tapping twice in any direction does uh something so uh double tap forward or back is a is a dash um you can jump twice so that's two taps uh if you like down down and a button is usually a launcher attack um also if you're getting wall slammed or floor slammed if you tap twice in the opposite direction of the way that you're falling then you do a quick recover and uh, retain some of your health uh, but also just <clears throat> most characters have a down down button quarter circle forward button quarter circle back backward button or a dash button right and those those are the main that's the main t tool set for every character it doesn't change that much so if you learn the inputs on one character you know the inputs on all the other characters more or less and um it's just about how how those moves come out what the timing is oh and the other the other big factor is the clashing mm -hmm. where um i was never good at defense as a generally a masher in fighting games <laughs> um and so it that you know i tried to play third strike when i was um, in high school at an arcade and I heard about the just defend or whatever or the perfect block and um, and I was like man that sounds impossible I don't mm -hmm. think I can ever do that right and I probably can't ever do that right because I don't have the staying power for it right. but in Asuka um, a hit cancels a hit so if you know how much this attack is how many times this attack is going to hit you can plan out your defense as offense and uh, I really liked that because it encouraged the kind of player like me who just always wants to press and who isn't excited by turtling or drawing someone out. Um, <clears throat> but I did find that as you know, as I played more, I was able to start to read situations, and I was able to find moments where it was like, "Oh, he whiffed that. Now I can do. All I have these options available mm -hmm. to me." And um, that was kind of exciting. It's the first and probably only game <laughs> where that <laughs> has happened for me, where I can really be like, okay, I've got this. I've got this narrow window here, and I can I can do something. Right. In, in the middle of their super, I can I can smack them. I can headbutt them, mm -hmm. or something. Uh, and I also think I was I was perhaps lucky to have chosen one of the more difficult characters in the game to start with uh, because th then when I started you know trying out the essentially Shoto characters that they have um, I was like well these are easy right. these are straightforward yeah. um, so yeah that's that's Asuka and that's part of why I like it there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to, to it I actually like compared to every other fighting game that I've played Asuka is the only one where I've almost never played it single player mm -hmm. like aside from that first time I hadn't played it single player uh, like through the story mode until today probably since <laughs> How is 2001 it? Um, single player is fine actually it's it really shows how uh, how much the game favors certain characters because the, the AI is it's pretty consistent, but it in what it does. But it's much harder uh, with a grapple character than with a projectile character, mm -hmm. just because the AI is not, you know, it 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 punishes certain things and and not other things. Um, but yeah, I, I made a bunch of notes just about things that I like. Like um, the projectiles in this game are often in arcs mm -hmm. and yeah. do multiple hits. So there will be like a, a parabola down or a, an arc over or <clears throat> a jump up and I hit a hit a projectile down that bounces. Um, and I like that kind of stuff because it's it's still predictable, but it is different. 
Right. Um, it's different without being too weird. You get, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, you get a moderate amount of air mobility too, right? Like not only do you get a double jump, but you can kind of control your descent a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so as like when you're when you're dealing with those projectiles too, it's not just oh I need to jump now or I need to block now. Like you have you have remarkably fine control in midair. Yeah, you can you can adjust, and many characters have attacks they do in midair that change what their position mm-hmm. is so or or let them hang so that you can like there there are a bunch of supers that cover the ground in stuff for a long time but it but you can do things to keep yourself up in the air so right. that that doesn't hurt you um and that's 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 pretty cool i i like um you know that that throw that i talked about with ryuko was really kind of at the core of me understanding this mm-hmm. game um and <clears throat> you know uh i would say that if you're playing this game against me you don't want to get caught in one of my throws because i'm definitely going to combo it yeah um but i like having that time to work a combo out because like he, she she grabs you and then she jumps and then slams you down mm-hmm. and in that time i have the space to think what I can do, like right. how far am I from the wall? Uh, where do I want them to be? Wh- uh, how much meter do they have? How much am I going to increase it by doing this? Um, and uh, you know, I guess that happens in in everything, but in in this game, it just all felt mapped out to me. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I'm still not a technical player, and um, I'm certainly not the best at this game. Um, I I play it by feeling more than anything else. It's really, it's <clears throat> like w- when when we s- introduced this game to you. I think it was uh, last year or something. Yeah, um, it, it was a couple of years ago at this point. But okay. Yeah, um, I remember. I was, uh, you know, at first you were getting beat up, mm-hmm. but then as you learned the system and figured things out, then you were suddenly the best in the room because you were a technical player and you can figure out what what a system is asking of you and how sure, to yeah. res- respond to it um but it's <clears throat> you know it's nice that like this is the one game where i feel like i can still hold my own against oh yeah the absolutely player so yeah. that's it's it's nice the the system revealed itself to me it yeah. didn't um i didn't read anything about it I it was it evolved from playing which yeah. was r- really nice um, so yeah that's uh, so, so that that is really interesting to me one of one of the thing one of the reasons that I wanted to ask you about your kind of fighting game history and also to like more broadly the goal of the podcast like part of it is is kind of a personal thing where I need to fi- I w- I'm trying to figure out like for work reasons and for personal reasons how people turn out of fighting games right yeah um, because I have at this point devoted about half my life <laughs> to yeah. fighting games in some form, and I'm weird, and I'm definitely the norm, and not the norm. But there are a lot, there there are a moderate amount of people out there like me, and we're the ones who show up at Evo and compete and stream and whatever, right? Um, and so I'm always interested to, to I, I like. I, I, as far as I can tell, it is it is like the, the confluence of factors necessary to keep someone in fighting games past the like the the first hour uh, is almost like like it's like lightning in a bottle or something, yeah. right? And I'm trying to catch it. And and so some of the the elements that I see come out of that story is like one, you had kind of a local rival, right? Yeah. But it wasn't yeah. someone that you hated that you right. probably hated to lose defense. Like he's a friend of yours, right? Yeah. Um, Two, you had this experience of, of competence early on, right? So it wasn't like you were getting shit on. Or even, it wasn't like you watched a bunch of YouTube videos, uh, because YouTube probably wasn't a thing back then. It was uh, not, it did not exist. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird to think about, but yeah. It wasn't yeah. like you, you went out and saw how it's done, right? Um, yeah. You had no idea what the apex was. You had no idea how, how deep the rabbit hole went. Um, but you found a, a little thing, a little just moment of competence, right? That that initial win over Vince that kind of wakes him up a little bit. And he's like, oh, okay, this is interesting now, right? Like, that yeah. that made you feel good, right? And so you know that he's trying to top you, and so you're going to try and figure something out, right? Um, yeah. And I think there, there are a couple other little things in there. 
um, well, actually, just more nuanced to, mm-hmm. to one of the main points, which is uh, early competence. Um, because I have, not just me, uh, we have shown this game to a bunch of people uh, that are, you know, friends and uh, people who we like to hang out with, mostly down in L.A. And, <clears throat> you know, people like Matthew Kumar. Yeah. And um, and uh, my friend Aaron Novak, these guys are not fighting game players. Nope. Uh, but they play Oscar because I was like, please play this game with us uh, because we're gonna play it, <laughs> and you're here. So uh, unless you want to be bored, come play this game. And <clears throat> we we sit down I, and we play this for a good like two hours each time. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's probably one of the games I've played the most in my life. Yeah. Um and. They, uh, you know, they weren't amazing at first, uh, but they got, they found a character that they liked and they started to get good. I remember this time when, when, uh, Aaron Novak, you know, he just, he had this run with, uh, with, uh, the baseball girl Mm -hmm. and he was just unstoppable and, and he was feeling great. And we were all like, dang, what happened? He just like. He just it it kicked in and yeah. he he knew what he was doing. Um, he only had that run once, but but we all remember it. Right. Uh, and so you know it's this game, and I'm surprised more games don't do it. Uh, this game just lets you in right away, but right. not as you know it's not as simple as it could be, of course, because it still uses essentially Street Fighter inputs. Mm-hmm. Um, but it. You know, if you're a person of around my age, you've probably tried Street Fighter a couple of times, right. and that's all that's all that you really need. Plus, well, I guess that other factor of uh, someone to get you in there a, and a, a local rival is very helpful. That was like for me with uh, with CVS two. One of the reasons I got there were two big reasons that I got into that game. One was uh, my ex girlfriend worked in an arcade, mm-hmm. and I could which one play, I could play for free. Which arcade, um, not which ex girlfriend? Yeah, uh, the <laughs> arcade was the one in the Metreon, which I forget the name of. Oh man, yeah, yeah. I I remember they I remember stopping by there back when uh, it, it wasn't even that long. It was like five years ago. It was like towards the tail end of that arcade, uh, and mm-hmm. they had they had Marvel two there for like a buck a play, and I'd, I'd stop by during my lunch break sometimes. Yeah, so CVS2 was like I would play against her but also just whoever was there and mm-hmm. I and the cool thing about CVS2 for me was I could use the characters that I was good at right from other games, yeah. S- Street Fighter and King of Fighters. <laughs> Cuz like I wasn't Who was your team? I wasn't I uh, my t- <laughs> my team was uh, very scrubby. It was uh Every time, hundred percent for sure. Ken and Joe. Okay. Uh, and then I would switch in or out. Um, Andy, Terry, or mm, Andy uh, wasn't Kyo. in that game. I wonder who. Terry and Kyo for sure. Oh yeah, no, not Andy. Sorry, T- uh, Terry or Kyo. Okay. Yep, that is, that is the pretty classic scrub character set. Yeah. So um, that was who I would play. <laughs> I was very I was very flowchart. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you won some i won plenty uh and i you know i really liked the role in that game Mm -hmm. and but i i quickly got (laughs) chastised by people for rolling and throwing they're like it's the cheapest thing don't do that and so i i never did that and then i started to get mad at people who did it and uh and then i would like really try really hard to beat them yeah and i remember this one time there was a there was this dude who looked like justin long i don't know if it was Justin Long. um who sat down and I wanted to play CVS too. And they were like, he had a, he had like a posse with him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as soon as he saw me start playing, he basically just looked away and started talking to his friends while he destroyed me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so I was like, well, I'm mad, but there's nothing I can do about this because this guy is just so much better than me at this. Um, another fun thing with CVS2 was when I was in Singapore, uh, I was hanging out with some 
uh, fighting game dudes just by happenstance because mm-hmm. my my one of my good college friends he's from Singapore and he moved back there and so he didn't have a lot of time to hang out with me so he's like here's my friend the only guy I know who likes video games who also has no job <laughs> <laughs> um, so I hung out with this dude Ramus who is um, a very high level um, Soul Calibur player cool in Singapore and is friends with Shen. Nice. That's how I got to go to Shen's Tough Cookie arcade. Aww. Uh and I saw I saw him play and, you know, I I I played against uh Ramus in Tough Cookie, uh some some Street Fighter Four. I don't remember which version it was at that point. Right. Arcade edition, maybe. I don't remember. Um but uh <clears throat> He totally, completely destroyed me, and uh, I was like, all right, well, that's cool. Uh, let's see what Xian can do. Uh, I, w- like, I was just curious, because uh, Ramus is like, this guy is actually really good. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well, you just made me feel like I wasn't even playing. So let's see how, mu- how much better that guy is. And then I saw Xian play Gen uh, against Ramus's Sagat, I think. And I was like, holy crap. Look what you can do with Gen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he. I think if I remember correctly, Gen was in the game since the console release of Street Fighter Four Vanilla, right? Yeah, but yeah. no one gave a shit. Yeah, no one. No one thought that Gen was anything, and you know, many people had said that to me, uh, or I had heard it in passing, and then, <clears throat> and I was like, wow, this is crazy. And so that was why when, when uh, Evo, what was it, twenty fourteen? No. When uh, Shen won? Yeah. I think it was twenty thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when when I saw that he was moving up and that he got to top eight, I was like, I'm I'm calling it. Shen's Gen is gonna is gonna take it. Nice. And then it and then it totally did. And I like I felt pride, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I didn't mm-hmm. do anything. Yeah. It just like he he was a guy who I had met before he was before everyone was like, oh yeah, that guy. Um, and yeah. that was really cool. But I was that was delaying me from my CVS two story. Which was that I then took Ramus to, we went to another arcade mm-hmm. um, in this big mall in Singapore. And he had never played CVS2 before. And so we were playing, and I was beating him. And then he was like, oh, so like when this thing happens, this thing happens. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, what if this? And I'm like, well, then that. And so after, you know, three matches, then he was completely schooling me. <laughs> Downloaded. <laughs> Yeah, because he's one of those, uh, you know, one of those relatively technical players who's right. just like, okay, well, if these are the things, then here's what happens now. Yeah. And this is how I play a video game. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. that's that's really interesting to to me to see those kinds of people. Yeah, I mean, and and it's the 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 way I've always thought about it is that like you learn one fighting game and then you learn your second fighting game and you realize, oh, these games share a common vocabulary, right? It's not a 100% overlap, but it's enough to give you a jumping off point to where you can start like deconstructing each game and thinking, oh, well, this is good and this is good. And I know from other games, which are similar, that that means the combination of these two things are good, right? Yeah. Um, that, I, I remember when you first told me that Shin story, though, and I, and I was just thinking, like, man, this is one of the reasons why I love fighting games. And, and honestly, like, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to, to get you on this show and more broadly like do a show like this where i talk to people who are kind of involved in in video games elsewhere to to talk about their overlap into fighting games because um for me personally fighting games have always been super distinct from everything else in the industry and it wasn't until i started like like kind of meeting people who worked in the business that i realized that no like everyone pays attention to fighting games in some form or another right and a lot of us have a personal connection to fighting games even if we're not a competitive player right like yeah um i you know i've 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 shot the show with adam saltzman the the cannibal uh dev about street fighter uh jamie chang the the i think he's the president of clay Right, the studio that did um, Mark of the Ninja and Don't Starve and all that stuff. Like he was super into Third Strike, and I met him at a party. We just talked about Third Strike. Fucking Nathan Vella stopped me from getting DQ'd in pools at Evo like a year or two ago. 
yeah um, which is amazing right like the dude's like the, like the founder of cappy games i think um, or i yeah. forget what his title is and he was oh, at evo yeah for the for the uh, for the indie game showcase he heard uh, someone calling out my name and just started texting me like oh hold on let, let me get him real quick like that to yeah. me is amazing you know yeah yeah um <clears throat> that kind of thing you know i'm i'm definitely nobody would say that i'm a great fighting game player mm -hmm. uh but i really i enjoy watching it and mm -hmm. i enjoy the drama of it especially when i know what's happening like the thing about street fighter is as long as somebody is there on a stream explaining it to me yeah i know what's happening and i know a little bit more than some people right uh and i know less than some other people but i i can i can see what's happening and you know, hearing what what the commentators say uh, enough times, and pay, starting to pay attention to the players who I would say are the ultimate characters of this game, mm -hmm. um, I start to be like, "Oh man, he totally dropped it," and then something happens, and and I love that. Like my my girlfriend really likes watching Evo, yeah, and Capcom Cup with me because. <clears throat> Well, for a couple of reasons. One is it's it's fun to just watch the drama and stuff. But another reason is that I vaguely know some of these people and I definitely know a lot of their backstory. And so we can be watching something and I'll be like, oh, yeah, this kid knuckle do, <laughs> you yep. know, he came he came from out of nowhere at like 18 and he started really doing well and he's sort of the new hope for america yep. in, in street fighter and someone and, someone actually dug up a game facts post from knuckle dude when he was like 15 and he's like asking some question on the forums and he's just like oh never mind figured it out or whatever right and then like two or three years later we're just like what yeah it's it's and it's so great and just uh one thing that she also mentioned was she liked how diverse it mm -hmm. is. I mean, we we as people who pay attention to fighting games are aware that it's a pretty diverse group of people, but it's it's like it's great to see a whole bunch of people up there being competitors and respecting each other and also disrespecting each other, yeah. but only in the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and it's 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 great um it feels like a relatively positive space yeah. and uh and it makes the drama much more fun mm -hmm. than uh than it than it could otherwise be yeah. so you know it's she doesn't play fighting games at all mm -hmm. and she really enjoys watching this and that to me says something about about fighting games, about competitive games, and yeah. about how they could and should be packaged. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah. I uh, did you watch Games Done Quick at all? I watched a little bit. I was pretty busy, but I I managed to watch some. The, uh, Irene and I were talking about this. Uh, I think on like one of the first few days, we're we're, we're watching the stream, and it, we're watching the stream specifically after like the I mostly watch fighting game streams these days. We're both mm -hmm. just like. Wow, the crowd is almost all just like kind of chubby white dudes, and yeah. that is like that's the face of games done quick, more or less, right? Like there just there aren't that many any many women or people of color or like well until like Sonic comes out or something, yeah, <laughs> um, it, and then then the black dudes start showing up, yeah. uh, and sometimes Mega Man, but yeah. I was I was joking around with some of my coworkers today that like what I really want is for is is like. You remember, like, the, 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 the first arc of Initial D where, like, Takumi's like, oh, is this really so great? Like, I, I never really had fun doing it before. I want yeah. that, but I want it with, like, a, a Brazilian kid who grew up playing a Genesis, like, well into, like, the 20 teens, right? Because right. That, that's, like, one of the, 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 the most, like, the widest install bases in Brazil or whatever. And he just knows how to play Ranger X. Because, and, like, yeah. he speedruns yeah. it, and he's got all this, like, frame-perfect bullshit and whatever, and... And that's like that's just how he plays the game, right? It's like, oh, is is this really so special? Like, like I want I want that manga, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, well, it's you know, it's, it's speaking of Brazil, it's kind of like a little bit like Kiyoma in the Capcom mm -hmm. Cup, where it was like, 
who was he? He was a dude whose friends told him, no, you're actually pretty good. Yeah. And then and mostly playing on the internet, I think. Like, yeah. And then he gets there and then he's like, w- was he top eight? Uh, I don't remember offhand if he is top eight. I remember he impressed people and he put on a good show. Um, I he don't got, think he, he made got, top eight. He got real far. He yeah. I think, far. I think he made top 16. He put um, a lot of people into losers. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the last arc of the fighting game, Brandon Sheffield story that I want to get to is like, uh, you've 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 kind of you pointed out these times. Oh, uh, so Danny RGT in chat is saying he got seventh. So I am wrong. You're right. Made yeah. top eight. Um, so I, one one thing I'm interested in is like you had that taste of of kind of local success and improvement and an, an investment in the game, right? Um, with with Vince and with uh, Asuka, and then later like a moderate amount of competence with CVS two. Like you're you're a or Street Fighter four, right? You're you're at least like confident enough to go and um and and you know just step up and play the game right which yeah. deters a lot of people right like the the right. prospect of playing fighting games in public of losing in public is uh is is intimidating to a lot of people but you've done it and that's no problem why do you so why do you stop like how what what is it about you where like when i got bit by that bug i got bit hard i was like oh i lost to someone i must never let that happen again right um yeah like you you know what it's like to feel to feel good or, or to feel invested in fighting to feel engaged right mm-hmm. um why like why why stop so there are s- several reasons i would say one is a lack of competitive streak when it comes to if i know that a bunch of people are way better than me i'm mm-hmm. like well that's that's how that is those guys are better than me, and I'm never going to be that good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, Daigo practices all, all day. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, all these guys, they, they practice constantly. And that's just not, it's not what I want to do. Yeah. So there's, there's the knowledge of the amount of time required to invest. Sure. And I just, I just don't have it, and I won't make time for it. So that's like the objective big one but so, then... but so so i'm curious why why compare yourself to daigo right like in any given year there can only be one evo winner and one capcom right. cup winner right um like at, at this point like i'm 30 years old i've resigned myself to like i don't stop daydreaming about winning evo but i'm not gonna win evo and that doesn't yeah. stop me from playing yeah so the thing is like <clears throat> i when I get more involved in Street Fighter, mm-hmm. uh, the watching of the streams and all that stuff, I realize how much stuff there is that I don't know how to do. Yeah. Um, like with Asuka, I can see somebody do something that I haven't seen before in this way. But yeah. I, when I see them do it, I'm like, oh, man, that's cool that you can do that. I know how to do it as soon as I see it. Because there's the game is so relatively simple. There's... There's only so much in there. There are like mm-hmm. 13 characters or, or 12. I don't remember exactly. Um, I think it's 12. Uh, and, you know, when, when you see something new, it's not going to take you long to figure it out. Now, I haven't read through the the combo FAQs that are on GameFAQs. Right. Um, because, my f- you know, I'm, my fingers are not dexterous enough, perhaps. No, I mean, they could be. But... I guess that's not what's Im- important to me about fighting games. What's what I enjoy is having this competition with some close friends and being able to, you know, watch the ebb and flow of a right. thing uh, while while I'm in it. And with with Street Fighter or Guilty Gear or any of these, there's there's this, you know, I'm I'm at the the lowest tier of competence basically like i am competent i i know what the moves are pretty much right but uh but i don't know what fadc means okay (laughs) um and i can't uh i look at uh decapere like doing forward and back dashy things and Mm -hmm. i'm like i understand that they're trying to bait someone out and then land a thing but can I do that? I can't envision doing that. Right. I can't envision figuring out how to do that well. So <clears throat> those kinds of things are what are what stop me. Like if if there were, however, a 
uh, an Asuka tournament or a uh, Garoden tournament at Evo, I would definitely sign up. Yeah. And I would, I don't know, I would love, I would love to not place in, at the top, mm-hmm. like near the top in Asuka. That yeah. would be so exciting to me because it would mean that there are other people Right. <laughs> play this game. Yeah, you have because not would... seen the top of the mountain. There are strong opponents out there, and you must test right. yourself. And, yep, <laughs> that's right. Um, so, so, you know, that, so that, sorry. That... Just, just to be clear, what where we're at is like you're not you. You are motivated by the same Ryu like quest as everyone else. It's just that the mountain you're looking at is this hipster ass fucking obscure mountain. <laughs> <laughs> like, there right, aren't that's... there aren't a lot of trails, but you know. <laughs> I'm trying to summit artisanal mountain over here. <laughs> My mountain's got a scarf. Uh, you know, it's, it's chilling. Um, but yeah, so it's it might. I think though, there's also the possibility that if, let's say, Oscar became one of the most popular fighting games in the world, mm-hmm. and it was played online, yeah. and people got really, really good at it. And now my best was not good enough, and I would have to study those combo FAQs, and I would have to learn how to like do keyboard style mm-hmm. uh, um, with my buttons, and I would have to get less sloppy. I would probably n- have less fun. Yeah. Um, I would probably pull back from the game. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of, one of the things that I, when I was playing today, that I realized about the way that I learned to play this game is that, you know, I would start to link together the things that you could do, but the timing was the toughest part. Mm-hmm. Like, how how do I do this when, or why do I want to do this at this time? And I found myself today just, you know, w- during this p- time period where I knew that, like, my, my hit was out or m- I was falling or, like, I was waiting to come out of a block stun uh not stun but a block um stance Mm -hmm. uh i would just spam this move until it would happen because i didn't know exactly when it was going to happen um but but for a lot of the other a lot of other in a lot of other instances i do know when it's going to happen and i don't have to spam i can just be like this is going to happen now and like if i could if i could erase that the spam part if mm-hmm. I could just be doing purposeful, intentional yeah. moves, then I would, I would be at a different level. And that's, that's the hardest thing for a player like me who doesn't play from, from a place of knowledge, but a place of instinct and memory, mm-hmm. like uh, muscle memory. It, this all comes from... It all comes back to play, it being interested in finding games for how they feel, because I all I just play by feel. Even though I can do some, some reads and and I can pay attention a lot more than I used to be able to with this with this game, um, I'm still a feeling player, not a not as much of a thinking or or mechanical player. Um, a, another little thing about Asuka that I neglected to mention that sort of kept me playing this game is there was a there was a game in the late 90s, early 2000s, called Queen of Heart 99. Yep, that was a good one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so the thing about Queen of Heart is it's essentially based on the Asuka system. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the characters play very similarly. And it's four players simultaneous. And, you know, uh, at, at Anime Club, after Anime Club uh, in college, we would play Queen of Heart sometimes. And <clears throat> there were a bunch of players of that game in our in our club and they all got really good at it <clears throat> and my base competence was was just coming from Oscar mm-hmm. um, but they were all better than I was but I was also on a team with one of those people that was better than I was okay and I was able to contribute and that was fun and then I found that some of what I learned there translated back into Asuka. Sure. Even though Asuka was a bit slower, it was more methodic- methodical, way fewer characters. Um, some of that actually came back. Um, and I think there's definitely something to be said for letting people approach one system a bunch of different ways. Um, and the, the, the using the same, essentially, essentially the same uh, 
like fighting system, these two games wound up complementing each other for me. Yeah, it's it is it 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 it, it is fascinating to me that you have had a lot of the sim a lot of the kind of foundationally uh, gratifying experiences that come out of fighting games and it didn't stick, right? So you had the feeling of mastery, you had the feeling of competence, you had the feeling of exploration, of of like kind of wanting more competition, and even the feeling of like fundamentals crossing over, system knowledge crossing over from one game to another, or something that like you stick around in fighting games long enough and you get to feel all that stuff. Um, but yeah. normally it happens with people who are far more driven in by the competitive stuff that you are. Um, yeah, so it's 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 weird because you know, you say it doesn't, it, it didn't stick, but there are definitely people out there who played Street Fighter 2 and then they stopped. Yeah. That, those are the people for whom it didn't stick. Like, yeah. I, I still play Asuka every time I go to Los mm -hmm. Angeles. So, it's like, it didn't, it didn't stick as a competitive thing, but it stuck as a hobby in a hangout time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I still like fighting games and I still play fighting games and anytime I get I get excited every time I get some new weird fighting game that has some bizarre system to it. And I like a lot of the time I can't figure it out and I have to watch someone like you play it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I like that that stuff is there. I like that people are trying these different ways of interaction. Like the, the match melee games, <laughs> uh, <laughs> groove on fight and, and, uh, and then Power Instinct Match Melee are, are my two favorites in that, uh, like the the Saturn one and the Neo Geo one. Um, the, those games, they just, the movements of the characters, when you're doing well, they all flow into each other mm -hmm. so nicely. It looks so intentional. And it really impresses me every time I play that game, even though I'm not great at it, just seeing what can be done. Um, and this dude that Tim and I know, Stabo in Los An I mean in uh, Tokyo, he played Rumblefish too, just for ages, and he got stupidly good at it. Um, he was one of the best players around at that game, mm -hmm. um, and it was such a very specific game. Like, what got him into it? I, I don't know how did he how did he wind up playing that game, but I had played Rumblefish one a bit on my PS2 by myself, yeah. and uh, and I was hanging out in Tokyo and I I went with him to TRF Arcade mm -hmm. in um, in Nakano, uh, and there was still a Rumblefish two scene going on there, and so I was trying to play some with him, um, and he was he was giving me tips. And he was giving me tips in a way that I could understand. Huh. Because he clearly learned the game by playing against other people and just figuring it out. Right. And he was like, you know, after you do this thing, then you can, like, if you use your fierce, then the spear is going to happen, and then this thing's going to happen. And but the way that he was describing it was he didn't use a, a term like FADC. Mm -hmm. he was like hit this button and then this thing happens um and it was it was just somehow simpler huh. and uh and more understandable to me have you seen the the anime haikyuu i think we talked about this uh, but have i have not, not yet seen, seen it? it yeah so haikyuu is this this baseball i mean volleyball mm -hmm. uh anime and the main ish character hinato he's always describing things uh, in in funny ways, he's like, "Give me the serve that goes shoom instead of the one that goes whoosh," and, uh, <laughs> which is and exactly how you describe things. Right. So it's 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 like when when uh, <clears throat> if if he's like, "Yeah, so just do this," and then the character will go like right through, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying." <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's that's funny to me because based on that description i'm 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 i suspect that you know fighting games well enough to be able to anticipate some like rather advanced properties of that move right so like if you're like yo give me the move that goes quite straight through you probably you're probably thinking oh uh i pro that's probably not a move i should use that often because it might be unsafe on block and you might not think about it yeah. like that but you would think oh yeah it's that kind of move 
right? Mm-hmm. It's yes, just like definitely. it's it's like you've you've kind of learned some so, some design patterns about fighting games are like burned into your brain, and you just understand them intuitively at this point. Yeah, I I think it was when it was that first time that we played, or no, maybe maybe the second time that we played Asuka, mm-hmm. um, you were saying that. It, and it was sort of the origin of this conversation, I think. You were saying that you were surprised. You know, you, you watched me play that game and realized that I had a an understanding of that game that was deeper than any other fighting game you had ever seen me touch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that I was actually applying, you know, some actual fighting game knowledge to what I was doing and was actually able to describe what was happening. Yeah. Not just being like I'm hitting these buttons and yeah. I'm gonna maybe do some sure you cans and just I hope you walk into them please. Uh, <laughs> I mean I remember <laughs> playing you in Street Fighter Four and that's roughly what you did. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah my my fa- see like <clears throat> when I was playing uh, Street Fighter Alpha Three mm-hmm. I really enjoyed the ability to jump into the air, do a hur as can do a hurricane kick that would go toward an enemy mm-hmm. and then uh hit hit that a couple times and then go into a show you can straight from there yep that was super fun for me and you know in oscar that's the kind of thing that you're supposed to do all the yep. time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it just took the things that i wanted to do with ken and made a video game out yep. of it so you know like that <clears throat> I want to be rewarded for the kinds of things that I want to do, mm-hmm. and uh, and and that's why that's why Oscar worked so well. And you know, again, talking about the things that stop you, there, I don't like I don't understand how to use a charge character. Mm-hmm. I understand objectively how to use one, but I can I have never, in all these years, figured out exactly when how long I have to hold back yep. and then forward to yep. do a sonic boom. Yep. Uh, especially because the manual said two, two seconds. seconds. Yeah. And I kept that in my head forever, and it's obviously not true. It's even it's even worse because if you look at the in-game timer, in most fighting games, the timer does not correspond to actual seconds. So right. if you think two seconds and you count out, it's actually much longer uh, on the timer. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, so charge characters are interesting because they're one of they're they're like they're a very obvious concession to to say like you get you get utility the utility of moves that often have are superior to their non charge counterparts and the uh, the the trade off is you need to to kind of st- quote store this elusive charge um, yeah so it's these these moves affect your ability to move freely more than other moves, right? Um, but the actual mechanics of playing them, yeah, there's a certain rhythm that you have to get into. Um, yeah, and I, I never I never got it, and I, you know, I I remember there, anytime a fighting game is like, okay, you move from this diagonal to that diagonal, I'm like, well, okay, you have lost me completely. Mm-hmm. And it's not possible for me. Like I think in um, Alpha Two and or Three. Um, Chun Li's got her her kick, super. Yeah. Uh, where you've got to go from down left to down right, and then uh, down left again and up right, mm-hmm. I think, and or forward, I should say, and uh, I I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like I just like I don't I don't know which how many wrong inputs I'm doing. I don't know which are the wrong inputs that I'm doing. And that kind of that kind of complexity is just that's the sort of thing that tells me no, you're not gonna yeah. get very good at this game because uh, if if like you can't figure out how to do this, and we're not gonna tell you, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we're not gonna tell you what you're doing wrong exactly. Yeah. Uh, because I like frankly, I don't know. Is it that I'm hitting too many additional directions? Is it? that I'm doing not enough? Am I not doing it at the right speed? Um, is, is, am I supposed to hit the button right at the end or, or, or simultaneously with my last input? I just don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it's, uh, you know, I just had to admit that I wasn't going to be great at that, but um, I can, 
I can play a simpler game and uh and have a really good time and I have come to feel that a simpler game doesn't mean a worse game or a like simpler doesn't mean less complex mm -hmm. uh it just means you can get into it faster because Oscar there's a lot of there's there's stuff going on and it's still it's not as simple as say smash um yeah. which probably people say it's not that simple but it's pretty simple and um, i mean even like uh in a bigger in, you know in the grand scheme of things street fighter 4 is a much much simpler fighting game than most of the ones that came before it yeah yeah but we saw sure. that that was arguably the highest level of competition we've seen in a fighting game um at least at that scale right like yeah. Uh, there's a really great uh, Japanese major third strike tournament last weekend, and it was really cool to see the dudes who just probably haven't stopped playing third strike um, mm -hmm. to see what that game looks like at a high level. But like the amazing thing about Street Fighter Four is that uh, it like we'd see new killers and Evo champions show up like years after the game came out, right? Yeah. Um, in any case. Uh, Thank you very much for sharing the fighting game side of things. I'd like to, to, to transition a little bit and talk a little bit more about stuff you're better at um, in the hopes that, that maybe I can learn a little bit more about, um, well, again, like a, a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in is skill acquisition and development. Because for me, I learned how to get good at things by being good at, by getting good at fighting games and then applying that, that kind of mentality and method to everything else. Um, and so I'm always interested in people who tried fighting games and kind of like found a a, a like less than all encompassing uh, uh, obsession with them, but then went on to do other things really well. So I've known you as a writer and an editor for a while now. Um, like I said in the beginning of, of this this show, like you're super influential. Uh, your your work has been super influential to me personally. Um, so there is that aspect of skill development, but I like to, that I like to touch on. Um, but also, I'm, I'm interested in how you took kind of the writing and editing skills and, and your taste, uh, which I think is, it's like, when I think about what, what, what Brandon Sheffield has at a person, as a person, right? Like, if I were to bring you on a game project, what would you, you bring? I feel like your taste and knowledge of, of a lot of esoteric stuff is probably this, the, like, one of your biggest assets, right? Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about kind of how you developed all those things, whether, whether like all three of them in conversation or, or perhaps, um, you know, separately, if that makes more sense. But because when I think of like what makes, and, and, and this is, this is an opportunity to talk about some of the games that you're, you're making too. Like, uh, when I, when I look at, at kind of the beginnings of what makes a Brandon Sheffield, uh, video game, it's, there's a lot of neat stuff that goes in there and, uh, like the as as game development as a whole kind of gets more accessible right as the tools and the methods and the publishing channels get more accessible um we uh i, I think what sets people apart is going to be more connected to uh your ability to create something kind of unique and distinct and cool and not oh i was able to to put out this much content or this complex an engine or push this many polygons or whatever um so yeah hmm. yeah so we can we, we can start talking about that stuff do you need like a drink or anything uh no it's okay okay i think i'm uh, i think i'm all right cool uh well i don't know actually maybe maybe i'll fill up i could fill up my tea <laughs> yeah go ahead and fill up your tea real quick we'll take a all right, break I'll, 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 I'll brb and i will encourage so i'm going to tweet this out too just just kind of that we're getting into the second chunk of the show but i'll i will encourage people who are interested in working in game dev um, if they want to show up with questions maybe we can handle some of them together because that could be a neat thing to do yeah sure okay chat how's it going shout outs to drinks y'all i got a whole bunch this is this is iced tea and this is some whiskey. Okay, I'm back. Yay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and tweet this out real quick. There we go. 
Okay. Yeah, all y'all in chat, go get yourself a drink. I would give you one if you were here. What, what was it that got all garbled up? I said I, I encouraged the people in chat to get themselves a drink, and we can talk game oh, dev yeah. and other stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, let's talk about the stuff you're good at and how you got good at them. Okay, so I'm not sure. It's hard for me to say that I'm good at any things, um, but uh, the taste thing came largely from, I think, not having a lot of games to play, mm -hmm. and then playing them and figuring out what I liked about them, and trying to find other games that I liked, and having that sometimes be challenging. Like, I remember this specific interaction um, with uh, somebody at a game store uh, when, you know, I played Gunstar Heroes on my stepbrother's Genesis, and then I went into a game store and I was like, what other games are there mm -hmm. that, are, that are like that? And they're like, N there are not really any. <laughs> and, um, oh. and, you know, they, they were pretty right, but not exactly, I don't think, for the reasons that they thought. Um, but, uh, you know, they recommended Contra Hardcore, I guess, which was sort of, sort of something. But I realized it was hard to find games that that I liked for the same reasons as other people. Yeah. Or, or rather, I, it was hard to find other people who liked games for the same reason as reasons as me, which was part of why Insert Credit was formed, because there were more people who liked games for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. um, or for <clears> other <throat> weird, but like uniquely weird reasons, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Like, when it and, comes down to it, I feel like your, your appreciation of games is very different from like what Tim or Vince or anyone else gets out of it. But we can yeah. all agree that all of us are weird, yeah. In an interesting way. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the most important thing, is to try to figure out why you like what you like. Mm -hmm. And and instead of being like, this game is better than that game, be like, this game re resonates with me because, because of these reasons. Mm -hmm. um, if, like, figure out who you are as a player um, and as a consumer of this, of this media. And and you know build from that like the thing that i always liked the most in games was um when they tried to do something and they didn't necessarily succeed but it had it gave you this feeling of like oh man look at that yep look, look what they tried to do over here and i just i i love that kind of stuff like there's this game um called Oh man, I'm, I'm bl blanking on it. Um, it's called uh, Crosswiper. There we go, Crosswiper for the PC Engine, and it's a. It feels like it's based on a Sentai anime, but it's not. Okay. Um, but you, you're a guy. You walk around and you punch and kick, and then you can transform into one of three different, superpowered guys. Um, and it's it's a tough game. It's got some interesting uh stuff to the combat but you, you're really rewarded visually by going through you know you start in a pretty normal town looking scenario but then you go you're fighting on this hover train in uh in the darkness with a neo tokyo glittering background going on i'm like all, all right. right i can hang this and then you get a little further and then <clears throat> there's this terrible intensely difficult section with all these pillars and these guys trying to knock you off but the music is great and there's this beautiful sunset behind you and i'm like well i can't be that mad because, <laughs> because i just i love this sunset and i love this music and as long as you give me a cool place to hang out for a while then i'm then i'm happy mm -hmm. and so i think realizing that for myself is what helped me identify what I like and don't like in games and what I what I like I I don't care as much about a polished perfect video game as mm -hmm. I do about something that feels different um so the you know no matter how smooth Halo 3 may be it didn't excite me as much 
as um as you know there's this uh what what's it called there's a uh a first person shooter from japan doom style but not using the doom engine and they tried to do some different things in huh. there and it's objectively a worse game and definitely not as as fun but it's it engages me mentally in a different way yeah and this could also be because i'm not a fantastic player of video games like i'm not super proficient at any of them but i I like to be there (laughs) so i want to i want to hang out in that world and so i think those those kinds of things helped me to identify what i like and don't like in games and and i because i was so interested in games i wound up building up this really big library of them and playing them all because i don't believe in collecting for collecting's sake so i've tried a bunch of different games and when someone's talking about a mechanic or something i have generally some references to that in my head yeah uh, right away which is which is nice but <clears throat> at the same time that kind of stuff can get me into trouble when making games because the things that I like are sometimes kind of vague and feelings oriented. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, depending on which person I'm working with, that can be cool or it can be frustrating uh, for me to have this idea of a direction I want to go, but not a full hundred percent immediate understanding of the mechanics of getting there right. so like with with Gunsport, which is a game that we're working on now which is 2v2 volleyball with guns kind of thing it's got a lot of wind jammers influence it's also influenced by this game called dog patch um made by midway in 1978 or 9 right and and, uh, and then just so we're clear for this stream Gunsport is not out yet um Oh yeah. And is there? Do you have like a target ETA for when it when slash if it'll come out? <laughs> Sometime in the m- later middle of this year, I would say is okay. when it should. Um, it has been available to play at uh, it. Like you brought it to Evo, and it's shown up at GDC a couple times. Like it's yeah. not impossible to find. And so if you ever find this uh, handsome looking dude demoing a game on the right side of the screen, it's probably Gunsport. Uh, I I remember playing your early prototype when uh, at yeah. like the I think we were playing at uh, the Hotel Figueroa, and yep. and it was great because like uh, Seth Killian came by and um, was it Nathan Gary came by and like we just had a bunch of dudes who immediately ju- like jumped into playing it and like it just it like it just it just clicked right like it just felt really yeah. good. Yeah, and but so a lot of the reason that it feels good is not because of me Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the reason that it feels good is because of the programmer yeah um who his mechanical understanding is greater than mine but um the feeling of the environment that we would create and the kind of game that it would be um a lot of that came from me but it also is a is a point of conflict because he would have much rather had a game where uh you know all the shots are essentially the same but the timings are different Mm -hmm. whereas i was like different weapons different shot patterns everything's different for every character um and that sounds crazy and stupid kind of um but it makes the game it makes you interact with the game in a different way that was more exciting to me but less exciting to him who plays third strike regularly sure. you know yeah. <laughs> um so but you, you know at, at the tokyo game show some some dudes from uh the guilty gear team came by and played the game for an hour straight sweet um and they had a lot of you know comments and criticisms and stuff but they were they were still just like just doing it um and i was really enjoying this one this one guy who had such precise movements with his hands he would because you know he must have played a lot of guilty gear yeah. <laughs> um he he was just like he was holding holding his like his controller down by his crotch he was just hol- holding his arms slack basically and 
and was just barely moving. Uh, and he was he was doing really well. He was being so efficient, and I really, I really liked that that was possible yeah. with this with this game. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, taste or and and to be clear, when I'm interested opinion, in your taste, uh, it's not just in game. Like, it, I think it's fascinating in games because that's the point where you have the most overlap, and also like uh, where I get to see the the output of your taste. Um, mm-hmm. Right, but like I feel like it's similar for like your personal fashion or music or art, right? Like and like to be honest, I never really th- thought of myself as the kind of person who was interested in cultivating opinions about stuff like visual art um, mm-hmm. until I met you and I saw and I think we were going around the uh, first Friday that one time and like you were shopping around oh, yeah. with some art, but like or like when we were when we first started working with uh, uh, Juan Ramirez on the Illos in GD Mag and it's like oh man, like. I hadn't really thought a whole lot about cultivating kind of like for me I'm I'm almost notoriously bad at developing any sense of kind of visual taste but to see you to mm. see how like to see your brain work at that kind of stuff was super fascinating for giving me kind of a template to work off of I guess f- for me like I want to sift through a lot of input and find the cool stuff mm-hmm. that is one of the things that excites me most. So when I, when I go to another country, I buy records there uh, and learn about what rock music was like in Korea mm-hmm. in the 70s or the 60s, uh, or versus what was it like in Vietnam, versus what was it like in Thailand, or what was it like in Poland or the Czech Republic, etc. And when you take a bunch of different cultural approaches to the same basic structure you find some interesting things um and a lot of this stuff will be crap but some of it will be really really cool Mm -hmm. and i would never have heard it otherwise so i'm always on the hunt for new stimuli uh so how do you find it like like what if i if i just gave you a round trip ticket to Fuck, I don't know. Uh, what's a good place? Let's say, mm-hmm. let's say, I park you off up. Uh, let's say, let's say, I just drop you in like India. Yeah. Right. That you're right in Mumbai or something. I know uh, exactly what I want. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> what what does what does Brandon Sheffield go do? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for stores that. One of the first things I'm gonna do is look for stores that sell records. Mm-hmm. Um, and. When I get there, I'm going to have in my mind a few things that I'm interested in. I'm interested in Bollywood music from the 60s, because a lot of it was synth, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, psych rock based, or some of it was. And then also early synth work in the 70s there was really interesting. So I'm going to start off looking for some of those things. And if I find a place that sells records, and I find a shopkeep who is knowledgeable and I ask about these things, they're going to be like, oh God, well, have you tried this? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to get some insight from them and they're going to teach me some things. I'm going to learn some things. This happened when I was uh, in, well, it's happened a lot of places, but there was this time I was in Hungary and I was looking for Hungarian rock music and I demonstrated that I, you know, I knew some, I knew some bands like Scorpio and, uh, Locomotive (laughs) Gete and, uh, and some other Hungarian bands. And he's like, all right, so you're an American guy and you are interested in my country's history through rock music. Mm-hmm. I have so many things to tell you. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was just like, this one, beautiful. You have to have this. And then this one, this has the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the guitarist from Ilesh uh, when he was at his prime. And so you should definitely listen to this one. And so, you know, th- these people are really excited to talk about things that they're interested in Mm -hmm. and so if you can find those things then that's uh if you can find those people then you're going to get a lot better Mm -hmm. stuff um so i I would do that i would also go to i I would also i'd also like to interrupt real quick and say when i gave you india as an example you weren't just like oh this is the method that i always use you're like oh they're already i'm i'm already planning out my trip right like because someday (laughs) there's going to be a game dev conference in india and some asshole is going to fly you out to give a stupid talk and while you're there you're going to come back with a suitcase full of records 
That's right. That's what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll go to a flea market of some sort, and I will look for any kind of weird old electronics games, um, mm-hmm. any kind of weird knockoff stuff that I can find, anything that's cool, uh, and I'll look for records there too. Yeah. And there it'll be more random purchases, mm-hmm. uh, just things based on whether I like the co- the cover or whatever. And also, since I'm in India, I will probably get some clothes made, which is something that I do in, uh, in China. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's hard to find the exact things that I want sometimes. Or sometimes I have a thing that I like, but it's falling apart, and right. I, want it, I want it again. And so I'll have someone remake it. Uh, so that's the other thing that I might do when I'm there. But the other thing is, um, and I guess it's kind of all related, is if I know anybody, I will find out what places they like to get a beer, where's the good vegetarian food. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like that's actually a really good in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Usually my first point of entry to any given country is who do I know here? Mm -hmm. Who do I vaguely know here? Who do I know from the internet here? Right. And you know a lot of people from the internet, thanks to mostly, I think, to insert credit. Yeah, or or through branching off of that from yeah. GD Mag or GDC, but ultimately it all boils down to insert credit. But um, it's like uh, I went to Finland, and I was thinking, okay, who the heck do I know in Helsinki? Do I know anybody? Mm-hmm. And then it turned out this dude Sulka from who was a GDC regular. And he was on, I think, the Europe advisory board at one point or something. Turned out he was there, and he was like, hey, do you want to come uh, take a drive with me and my family up to my grandfather's cabin in Sweet. the woods? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> so drove up to a nice cabin near a lake. We walked to the lake and ate cloudberries from the ground. And, um, and I had a home-cooked finished meal of like root vegetables and stuff and i was like man this is this is pretty awesome and so just just having that as my first experience was like okay i kind of i see what's going on here a little bit like i'm not scared of this place anymore um but yeah in general it's like use 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 some point of familiarity to then put myself in a slightly different position that i wouldn't be in otherwise and then try to learn something from that and i think i apply that to all of all of my appreciation of media movies video games music art uh fashion any of those things one thing that i've noticed and and this is kind of uh i something i realized about myself a while ago is that i I am drawn to people with like skills or facets about them that I want to emulate. And one of the things I, I realized after the fact with you is that like you're remarkably tolerant about hanging out with random jerks from the internet. <laughs> like you give a lot of people a, a, a chance, right? You're, like when, especially, and this is this is again in the kind of the the. Uh, the, you know, the backdrop of game development, where it's so easy to find people who are just like, oh, did you make any of these, like, like do you have a, th- have you made a thing that I know about? If no, fuck off, right? Yeah. Or like, maybe, maybe less mean, but like, you're not worth my time or whatever, right? Yeah. Whereas like, I feel like uh, you are remarkably... I don't, I don't know if it's if it's like patient or you're willing to give people the benefit of the doubt or maybe it is that like insert credit and the work you do by now are such a good filter that anyone who bothers to get in touch with you must be interesting in some way um, <laughs> there could be some of that I, th- I think it's mostly just if someone approaches me and seems to be <clears throat> either nice or genuine or both ideally both then I'm fine with talking to them and if the way that i respond to whatever they say to me doesn't make them leave or think that i mean because that seems to happen a lot actually (laughs) uh then we can have a conversation like if someone comes over and they feel it it feels immediately like they want something Mm -hmm. then that conversation is not going to go well at all right but if they come over and they're i don't know they like my shirt or they uh, heard my talk and have a question or they like they're like oh, I, I just wanted to tell you I really like insert credit 
Um, then they get really nervous and then they want to go away and I'm like, no, that's cool. Let's, let's have a conversation. How are you doing? What's going on over there? Um, <clears throat> cause it's, it's nice to feel like, I feel like one of, one of the big things that would solve a lot of the problems that we're having with people being angry about video games right now mm -hmm. is if they felt like there were other people who thought that they were smart or, um, wanted to hear what they had to say. And I feel like if, if more people felt like they were listened to or appreciated just as a person, uh, they would in turn pass that along and be more understanding of other people. Um, yeah, that's what I think. That's a really nice sentiment, man. I like that. <laughs> it's definitely like, I don't know, the, the more that I put myself out there on, online, um, especially after releasing the Street Fighter book, and um, that that kind of got me to the point where I will occasionally get picked out at FGC events, and they'll be like, oh, hey, I like your thing, or whatever. And I try to be, <laughs> like, encouraging of that kind of stuff, right? Even if it's just a, hey, what's up, and a handshake, or, like, let's talk about this thing, or let's go get lunch, or whatever, right? Like, And, and I think a lot of that was inspired by just seeing, like, like literally anybody from the internet come by and just be like, oh, you are Brandon Sheffield. I read this thing that you did this that the, at the time of the place and you talk about it and then you talk about other stuff and maybe they kind of follow you around for a while and it's totally okay, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You actually do kind of have like a, like this like Space Channel 5, like like you just walk around at an event and eventually people start following you. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, I think other people maybe have more of that, but I, <clears throat> I feel like... I do I do have a tendency to to group up, mm -hmm. but um but I don't feel like I'm necessarily the the leader of that group. It's just uh, I guess other people. Oh, uh, your audio cut out. Hold oh, up. Sorry, yeah, that's my fault. I folded, <laughs> I folded my arms and uh, and I hit my little my little button. Nice. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily feel like I'm the leader of of that group walking around. It's just uh, it's a group mm -hmm. that forms and um. And we're all doing stuff like I don't know. <clears throat> my one of uh, one of the programmers I'm working with right now, Shane in Ireland, he um, he just sent me an email before GDC, being like, "Hey, uh, what if we hung out at GDC?" And I was like, "That's cool." Um, and then he showed up he turned out to be a nice guy he had actually done a little testing for me on gunhouse cool uh, which i i didn't actually put two and two together until after we were hanging out uh, <laughs> that he that that was the same person but um you know he was really pleased to be treated like a real person mm -hmm. and we, you know we went around to all the same industry things and <clears throat> i guess he was so used to people being jerks that he was just like it's nice it's nice to be appreciated and respected instead of instead of being like oh hey yeah that's cool that you're here well see you later bye i'm gonna go and do important things um and now now you know we've been working together for more than a year and so it's kind of maybe embarrassing to talk about at this point but uh <laughs> I, I i do appreciate that as, as almost like the kind of the practical backdrop of all this though which is like a lot of the work that that you've done on uh, necrosoft so far and the stuff that you've been working on has happened not because you had like amazing resources to draw from or even like high level connections it was like oh i was nice to you <laughs> Right, yeah. we had a conversation like human beings, and that was enough to get you on board with doing this thing, right? Yeah, yeah, um, and I just hope that nobody follows me down the wrong path as a result of that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not to lead anyone to ruin. Um, but yeah, it's just you know being being a genuine person to other people gets you gets you far, and that's what got me this shirt. Yeah, this I, shirt. what what is that shirt? Um, can you can you kind of see it here? I see. Hurry, uh, our sale ends something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this this here is what um, Agent York Morgan, uh, Francis York Morgan, puts his coffee cup down on on the uh, 
on the newspaper he's reading in Deadly Premonition. In the <laughs> oh my god. Hur hurry to Harry. It says Harry right here. <laughs> um, this is a, this is a one-off um, Deadly Premonition shirt that, that Swery made for me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, because Swery and I talk to each other like nice dudes, mm -hmm. he made me this shirt. Aww. Um, yeah. Alright. Uh, so... I want to I want to conclude that chapter by saying uh, you have and, and we've we've actually gotten some people in chat asking about your games so uh, I, I want to get to some of the questions that people are asking in chat but before we do I want you to plug something from somebody else that's not yours yeah so this is an easy one but um, I feel like not a lot of people are making games like Downwell Downwell um, yeah a lot of people are making games that are uh about feelings or thoughts or ideas and that's cool but mechanics people don't appreciate mechanics enough mm -hmm. and like what feels good to play and if there were a if there were a so-called game feel category of the IGF i think downwell should win because it's so it's so chunky and the inertia is also predictable and every time you mess up you're like damn it i messed up mm -hmm. it's <clears throat> it's a very as soon as i saw a video of that game i got jealous <laughs> <laughs> that's a great feeling yeah and and then i i met him and i'm like wow he's a cool guy that ojira sweet and uh so yeah downwell i think downwell is really cool oh but another one i would like to plug is um is dropsy dropsy yeah, Dropsy is a uh, point-and-click adventure game about hugging people. It's about being a scary clown that just wants to hang out with people, but people are scared of him. Um, and sweet. it's it's a very sweet, feelings-oriented game. It's the opposite of the thing that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but not enough people played it, and I would like for more people to play it. I think that it's, you know, Undertale came out just a bit after that, and, yeah. and they were both aiming for the same kind of idea, mm -hmm. but um, nobody played Dropsy. Yeah. Did you play Undertale? Uh, nope. Okay. Uh, I think you should, at least because this is, I feel like, I, I just played it uh, through my first playthrough like a week or so ago, and... Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think at this point you should play it just because it will inform a lot of uh, like future work, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of, it's one of those just those like milestone games in the in in the industry's history where like you just at this point like you might not be that impressed. Uh, I was super like I, I was super impressed. I I played that game and like you know how you know how uh, this is actually is is interesting. I was talking with um, this this uh, Twitter bro. Uh, Kayan Nasaki, he's the dev on I Want to Be the Guy. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he and I were talking about how, like, we both play that game, and as someone who start, who's been working in games, when you play a game and you see the kind of creative decisions that, that a dev makes, you you, ha you understand why, right? You can see behind the curtain enough to think, oh, they did this because they want me to feel this way or think this thing or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting, but maybe I would do it the same or maybe I would do it differently. And with Undertale, I was consistently running into the feeling that uh, whatever happened next was not something that I would have ever thought of. Um, mm. So, like, I would I would play it, like, to me it was kind of humbling to play it and just think, like, I don't know who the fuck this dude is, Toby Fox, like, I don't know who the fuck he is, but he just came out of nowhere and made something that just, like, hit super hard. Um, and yeah. so I think you should play it for that, even, like, I don't know if you like it or not. Now, okay. um, but, uh, so those are some, some rad suggestions. Definitely, we've got some people in chat talking about them already, so it looks like you've yeah. had some traction there. Um, you want to go through some questions now? Sure. Okay, so, to start with, actually, before we even started the stream, uh, oh, it won't scroll up that far, but there's someone asking if there's any way to get the games that you released, I think, on PlayStation Mobile, uh, now that that's all shut down. I guess their memory card got corrupted. Is there, like, like uh, can you get those games? No. No? <laughs> Right, the answer happens. to that question is no. However, um, if you want if you want to play Gunhouse, you can get it on the Android. I mean, the Amazon store. It works huh. on an Amazon devices and some other Android devices, but not really. We wanted to. 
that's that's a game where like I have felt as though I want to I want to finish it. It's not finished yeah. for me. And so I haven't put it out on other platforms, the version that exists. And I almost feel like at this point maybe I should have put it out because it's been like more than a year, probably a year and a half since mm-hmm. the game first hit PlayStation Mobile, maybe two years. And so I, I could have put out an iOS and Android version a year and a half ago and then built a new version later and it, people would accept that. Uh, yeah. I wish I wish I had done that. But we do have it on... It works on some Android devices, so you can get that. But, oh, dear, we're trying to... That was just the work... alpha that you released on PSI. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, dear, alpha. We're trying to do a PS... I mean, a PC version of mm-hmm. just the alpha. But I... You know, we don't really have time and resources to right. do it. So a, f- a friend of mine's doing it in his spare time, but not really doing it right now. Um, so, but I think that'll that'll happen eventually. Eventually, we're going to make the final version of of Odir. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I have a bunch of questions from our friend Ian Adams that I'll just go through at once. He's mostly trolling right. you in chat. We yeah, have Pat. Can you ask Brandon how come he's so dumb, and also why his taste is wrong in everything? It Plus, is a, tell him it, that I love him. It is a good and difficult question to answer. Um, I. <laughs> A fun thing with with Ian is, and this is similar to like you know playing Oscar with your with your pals in in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he's got a Neo Geo cabinet, and <clears throat> he wanted to play. He like w- there was a time when he was asking anybody who came over if they wanted to play Magical Drop Three, <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's hard to find people that. A, know what it is, and B, are any good at it. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he asked me if I wanted to play Magical Drop 3, and I was like, heck yeah. And then we played, and then I won, and he was, like, so happy. <laughs> because he yeah. had been destroying everybody. Yeah. Um, and so now, you know, we were actually pretty equally matched um, at this game. We both knew how to play it. Nobody needed to... Like, we both tried to pick world at the exact same time as our character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, that was that was a fun little thing. And it's it's so great when you find when you find or can introduce someone to a game that you like that there isn't a whole bunch of fanfare mm-hmm. for. That happened also when uh, when I brought Al, Al Yang yeah. and Vince over to play Landmaker this Taito, this game on the Taito F3 board. Um, it's a really fun puzzle game that totally took me by surprise. I bought it in Japan for 20 bucks. Uh, I just bought it because it was cheap. And then I played it and I got super into it. And now just the three of us are really into that game. And we, we both play it whenever... This this is the game that we play here in the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, when I, when I go down to LA, we play Oscar, and then when we come here, we play Landmaker. <laughs> oh, I wanted to mention briefly. Uh, I think it was you and Vince that introduced me to Twinkle Star Sprites, and that actually oh, yeah. ended up ca- coming in super useful for a game jam, an internal game jam when I worked at Riot, um, where mm. we were th- we were thinking of making like kind of like a versus mode shmup, and I was like. Oh, you guys want to make Twinkle Star Sprites? Star Sprites. Okay, we can just do that. Yeah. And they're like, "Wait, what?" And so I showed them the videos yeah. and everything. And <laughs> but I, I, I was like, in that moment, I was like, "Oh, Brandon would be proud." That's right. Um, yeah, it's it's that's one of those things where people are like, "Okay, I've got this idea. You've never heard it before." And then if if you've played a, like a huge number of games because you're a big idiot, you can just be like, "Oh yeah, I like this game." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially when it comes to Japanese games from the nineties. Hmm. <laughs> Um, further questions from Ian include also if you could ask him why he's so bad at Ascension that'd be great uh, how'd you get your I hair so finished. cool why do you refuse to look at the camera and can and this is probably the best ones can you have Brandon tell the story about how oh dear was my idea oh yeah um, well my camera is up here so it's a weird place to look mm-hmm. uh, that's that's the reason for that my cool hair I got yesterday in, uh, in um, the uh, new Chinatown uh, at Thon's hair salon. Wait, wait which and, area are we calling New Chinatown now? Oh, that's. Uh, I mean, it's always kind of been New Chinatown. It's um, it's on International and Twelfth. Gotcha. Um, 
yeah, south of the lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where all, all the Vietnamese, Cambodian, right. and Laos and stuff. Yeah, they, they opened a Lee Sandwiches over there. I'm super hype. Yeah, they did. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's been casually called New Chinatown for mm. a while. And, and there is, in fact, a business called New Chinatown Pharmacy Okay. Uh, over there. Um, but I don't think that's its official name, if it has one. Uh, and then the, about how Odir was originally Ian's idea, basically he we we were still using AOL Instant Messenger at the time. Nice. And I was at working at Game Developer, and he pops up in chat and says, "Hey, you know those uh, those signs that say Deer next X number of miles?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And he said, "What if what if when you saw that?" the road was just flooded with deer for that for that number of miles. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that would be weird. And then he's like, uh, we should make games about that. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so <clears throat> he and Frank Cifaldi and I all promised to make uh, a game based on our own interpretation of that, and only, we, only I did it. Yep, you sure did. Yeah. Um, Although, uh, you know, I didn't. I don't want to say I did it because yeah. we did it. I, I I will say uh, one of the fascinating things about seeing you go through Oh Dear is the kind of like the the, the game that you're ending up with is like it's like Outrun right so you've got like yeah. a two, a faux 